Good afternoon. The first item of business is portfolio questions, and the first portfolio is COVID-19 recovery and parliamentary business. Uh, if a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should press their request to speak button during the relevant question or enter the letter R in the chat function. And as ever, to get in as many members as possible, I would appreciate succinct questions and answers. Question number one, Jackie Dunbar. Oh, uh, sorry, Mr. Bar. Point of order, Donald Cameron. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I make this point of order further to the one made by Stephen Kerr last night and uh, in light of the response of the Minister for Parliamentary Business in relation to the potential appearance of the Lord Advocate to answer questions on the referral of an independence referendum bill to the Supreme Court announced yesterday by the First Minister. As you will recall, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, the First Minister stated that she believed the Lord Advocate would be willing to answer questions from MSPs. Uh, and the Minister for Parliamentary Business um, stated in response to Stephen Kerr's point of order that um, he said uh, that members know, and I quote, that the subjudice rule is recognised by Rule 7.5 of Standing Orders by reference to the Contempt of Court Act 1981. That rule properly prohibits parliamentary debate on matters that are currently before the courts. Its purpose is to help maintain the boundaries of the relationship between the legislature and the judiciary, and it should be respected on that basis. The 19, and he went on to say the 1981 Act is concerned with hearings and does not spell out when proceedings are active specifically for references like the one made today. Um, and with the greatest of respect to the minister who I see um, on, the, on the front bench, um, I would take issue with that. Um, as he said correctly, Rule 7.5 of our standing orders contains the rule on subjudice. That states that a member may not refer in proceedings of Parliament in relation to which legal proceedings are active. That is correct. Um, secondly, that legal proceedings are active if they are active for the purposes of Section 2 of the Contempt of Court Act 1981. Turning to Section 2 of that Act, that in turn refers to Schedule 1 to that Act. And that schedule refers to a number of different types of proceedings, to criminal proceedings, to civil proceedings at birth, both first instance and appeal. And while there is no reference to a referral of a devolution issue, um, it is caught, um, Deputy Presiding Officer, by paragraph 12 of that schedule, which is a catch-all provision. And it catches um, the referral by the Lord Advocate. And that paragraph 12 says, proceedings other than criminal proceedings and appellate proceedings are active from the time when arrangements for the hearing are made or if no such arrangements are previously made from the time the hearing begins until the proceedings are disposed of or discontinued or withdrawn. Now, in terms of the uh, referral by the Lord Advocate announced yesterday, no such arrangements for a hearing have so far taken place. Uh, thus, uh, the Lord Advocate's referral cannot be said to be active proceedings uh, for the purposes of our standings order, either in law or in terms of the standing orders. Therefore, there is nothing uh, to prevent the Lord Advocate coming to this chamber to take questions from MSPs. That is in accordance with a wider position in, in Scots law. And so, for those reasons, Deputy Presiding Officer, I re reiterate the calls for the Lord Advocate to appear tomorrow in the chamber before recess. This is urgent. Of course, if we wait till after recess, the hearing may well be arranged and the subjudice rule may well apply. This is Parliament's one and only opportunity. And in the interest of transparency and openness, and given the proper role of this Parliament in scrutinising government, and given the very significant national issues raised, I would ask you, uh, uh, on behalf of the presiding officer and the Bureau, to reconsider, especially in light of the fact that the First Minister herself said she thought that the Lord Advocate was amenable. I apologise for going on at some length, but as a law of deputy presiding officer, you'll know how important it is to outline the provisions. Thank you. I thank the member for his point of order. Standing orders provide that matters in relation to active legal proceedings can be referred to only to the extent that is permitted by the presiding officer. In relation to the reference to the Supreme Court, my understanding is that the case is not currently active and therefore the sub rule is not currently engaged. Once a date for a hearing is set, 
The expectation is that the rule would be engaged. At present, there is no indication of when a hearing will be set. And of course, uh, at that time, it would of course be a matter for the PO, the presiding officer, to, to apply the rules at that time in the normal way. As regards any statement by the Lord Advocate, that of course would be a matter for the Bureau in the first instance. Thank you. Okay, uh, we will now uh, move to portfolio questions. I call question number one, Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its COVID-19 recovery policies across government are helping to address any COVID-19 related staff shortages across Scottish pub public sector bodies, including in Aberdeen Donside. Deputy First Minister John Spinney. President Officer, amongst the measures taken by the Government to assist public bodies in addressing the issue of COVID-19 staff shortages in Aberdeen Donside, um, Aberdeen City Council will receive in 2022-23 £409.8 million to fund vital day-to-day -day local services, which equates to an extra £35.2 million or an additional 9.4 per cent compared to 21-22. Councils and other public sector bodies have flexibility to manage their resources and budget as long as they fulfil their statutory obligations and jointly agreed national and local priorities. The Scottish Government and COSLA have agreed shared priorities for recovery targeting support for those most affected during the pandemic. Jackie Dunbar. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. And I welcome that NHS Grampian have changed their approach to recruitment to strengthen participation in international recruitment initiatives, promote links with further education, apprenticeship programmes, and are undertaking a review of all agency staff, as well as providing mentoring roles to older staff. Will the Deputy First Minister join me in welcoming this outward-looking approach from NHS Grampian, and can he comment on how the Government are further enhancing efforts across the public sector? Deputy First Minister. I, I, I do welcome the steps being taken by NHS Grampian, and it is part of the work being undertaken within the National Health Service to expand the recruitment of staff and to exhaust all options to try to address the shortages issue. Um, obviously, there are challenges about international recruitment exacerbated by the um, issues around Brexit and immigration, but the Scottish Government will certainly work with health boards and encourage them to take the steps that have been taken by NHS Grampian. And supplementary, Jackie Bailey. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that a circular was issued by the Scottish Government this week, removing the temporary COVID protections from NHS employees. In particular, NHS employees with long COVID have contacted me worried about what this means for their jobs. They don't have access to proper diagnostics and treatment. Long COVID is incredibly debilitating, and they're concerned that they will lose pay and lose their jobs. Will the Cabinet Secretary review this policy urgently and reassure staff with long COVID that they will still have jobs to return to? Deputy First Minister. Uh, obviously, we are in a situation where the Government is absolutely committed to the Fair Work Agenda. So the issues that Jackie Bailey raises are issues which would be addressed by the Fair Work Agenda. Um, individuals who face challenges with their health are obviously entitled to employment support, uh, support from their employers as part of that activity. And I would want to reassure members of staff that that would be the case. If there are particular instances that Jackie Bailey is concerned about and that have been drawn to our attention, I would be grateful if you would share those with ministers, and we will certainly explore any anxiety that's, uh, that uh, is in the minds of staff as a consequence of that guidance. Willie Ray. Uh, following on from Jackie Dunbar's question about uh, the NHS, I am very concerned about the current state of primary care. I mean, in GPs, poor workforce planning means that Scotland is about 225 whole-time equivalent GPs short. And according to Audit Scotland, little progress was made on recruiting more before the pandemic even hit, with only 39 recruited in three years. So what can the Cabinet Secretary tell us now about the recruitment of GPs to make sure we can deal with the current crisis? Deputy First Minister. We, 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 I acknowledge that in some parts of the country there are particular challenges about the recruitment of general practitioners, and without generalising too much, that would be more acute in rural areas than in urban areas, but, it's, but urban areas are not without their challenges as well. Uh, the Government has ob obviously invested heavily in the recruitment of general practitioners and has worked to make general practice attractive through a number of different interventions 
about reducing, for example, the financial burdens that some general practitioners uh, have been expected in the past to carry um, and to enable them to be better supported by NHS infrastructure. We are in a situation today where we have more GPs per head of population in Scotland than other parts of the United Kingdom, but we must continue to work to ensure that we replenish the recruitment of general practitioners, and that is a priority of the Health Secretary as we speak. Question number two, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether its COVID-19 recovery planning will include measures to improve access to interpreters and translators for people using public services. Deputy First Minister. President, so the COVID recovery strategy is focused on bringing about a fairer future, particularly for those most affected during the pandemic. We will do this by transforming public services to ensure they are person-centred in design and delivery and support communities and the most vulnerable to thrive. As part of this transformation, the Scottish Government is committed to improving and embedding inclusive communication within government and across public bodies and is currently reviewing the effectiveness of the public sector equality duty in Scotland. Analysis of consultation responses to proposals designed to support public bodies to better meet PSED and Scottish specific duties requirements is expected to be completed by August of this year. Monica Lennon. Thank you. I welcome that response from the Cabinet Secretary. Sessional interpreters were rightly considered to be key workers during the pandemic and they continue to play a vital role in COVID recovery and in assisting the NHS and justice services. Um, trade unions however, have been raising some concerns about fair work and seek assurance that the government will do everything it can to ensure that sessional interpreters employed in the public sector are covered by the terms of fair work. A meeting was requested on the 29th of March between the STUC and the Minister for Fair Work. Unfortunately, the meeting has not happened yet. Can the Cabinet Secretary take that meeting forward or ensure that a relevant minister will meet with the STUC at the earliest opportunity? Deputy First Minister. Uh, President Officer, I, I welcome the, uh, the, the work that has been undertaken by sessional interpreters at all times, but particularly during COVID. It would have been particularly significant for individuals and, of course, in the context of welcoming uh, some of our, um, uh, our guests from Ukraine. It is ever more important in our communities. Um, Monica Lennon properly uh, reflects the Government's support for the Fair Work Agenda. I had a discussion just last week with the STUC um, on uh, relevant issues. Um, I will be happy to explore the issues about a meeting with Ministers uh, to address any of these concerns, and I will make sure that is taken forward as a consequence of this exchange. Question number three, Sarah Boyack. To ask the Scottish Government how its cross-government COVID recovery policies will take account of the recommendations of its COVID-19 Ventilation Short Life Working Group. Deputy First Minister. Presiding Officer, our Ventilation Short Life Working Group made 10 recommendations aimed at improving awareness of the contribution ventilation has in reducing the risk of transmission, regulations, guidance, technical skills and air quality in buildings. Work is in hand to take forward the recommendations. We are prioritising actions that can be taken quickly to improve ventilation ahead of this winter to improve our resilience against COVID-19 and other infections. I will be writing to all members of Parliament this afternoon to provide more detail than I can put on the record just now on the Scottish Government's progress in relation to these recommendations. Sarah Boyack. Can I welcome the Deputy First Minister's answer? Um, because I have had constituents getting in touch and organisations getting in touch because the working group was due to publish its recommendations by March and these had not gone on the, pub, on the Scottish Government's website. And as the Deputy First Minister said, um, with COVID still being with us, one in 20 in Scotland having COVID, it is more important than ever to improve indoor ventilation. So could the Deputy First Minister say, given that the recent report by Royal Academy of Engineering showed that improved ventilation would add billions to the economy, could the Deputy First Minister at least say what higher standards or investment in ventilation he will be delivering to keep people safe? Deputy First Minister. Let, let me acknowledge the importance of the point that Sarah Boyack raises. And the, uh, the, the working group gave us very clear recommendations. I uh, will set out in a letter to members of Parliament this afternoon the steps that we are taking. But fundamentally and in principle, we accept the recommendations of the group about the importance of taking forward the ventilation strategy, of improving ventilation in our buildings, of recognising the benefit that has for the well-being of individuals and also for the well-being of the economy into the bargain. 
and supplementary murder freezer. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, there are many businesses, particularly in the hospitality sector, that needed financial support in order to uh, improve their ventilation. The Scottish Government set up a £25 million COVID ventilation fund for business, but this paid out uh, less than £1 million before closing. The Federation of Small Business said it was guilty of clunky administration systems and serious delays in getting cash out to firms. Why does the Cabinet Secretary think this fund was such a failure? Deputy First Minister. I think we've, we've, got to be, you know, there's, look, we've got to be careful about the distribution of public money. Um, on any other day, Mr Fraser could be putting to me the Audit Scotland report that was demanding more information about the distribution of public funding. And um, so on this occasion, Mr Fraser is coming here essentially asking me to gather less information than on another day he would be demanding I collect more information. So I think what we've got to look at, we've committed to evaluating the 2021 Business Ventilation Fund. We'll consider the recommendations of the ventilation subgroup in the light of that evaluation, recognising that the government has um, every interest in making sure that funding schemes we make available are impactful within the business community. That was the case with the COVID uh, recovery funding. If there are lessons to learn about the administration of individual funds, we will learn them to make sure the processes of government are as efficient and smooth in all circumstances. Question number four, Ruth McGuire, who is joining us remotely. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made on ensuring that all voters in Scotland can exercise their right to a secret vote. Minister George Adam, I hope you got enough of that. Yep. It's on the business bulletin anyway. So. Yeah. On you go. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. The secrecy of the ballot is, of course, fundamental to our democracy. That is why we continue to work with partners to explore a number of practical solutions for voters who face barriers. The upcoming consultation on electoral reform is a further opportunity for those with an interest to contribute ideas to this important agenda. Uh, Ruth McGuire. Thank the Minister for that answer. As he says, voting independently and confidentially is one of the basic rights of our democracy. It is unacceptable that so many blind and partially sighted people still experience problems doing so. Will the Minister commit to acting as promptly as possible to ensure this right is realised for all voters in Scotland at the next poll? Minister. Those that are blind and partially sighted have been one of the key groups that we have been working with to make sure that we get solutions to some of the problems. But our programme for government explicitly includes a commitment to improving accessibility uh, of elections. Understandably, progress has not been as quick as we would like to over the past few years. However, as I have made clear on a number of occasions now, I am committed to this agenda. I want to see improvements brought forward from the work I just mentioned as soon as is practical. practical. Question number five, Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether its COVID recovery strategy includes the provision of funding for charities working to strengthen community resilience and support mental health. Deputy First Minister. President Officer, the COVID recovery strategy highlights the importance of charities and community resilience. Our social enterprise and volunteering action plans will strengthen this role. We have committed £120 million of recurring funding to support mental health and wellbeing, including £36 million over two years through the Communities Mental Health and Wellbeing Fund for Adults. The fund recognises the role of community groups supporting nearly 1,800 projects. We are providing local authorities with £15 million per annum to fund over 230 community mental health supports for children and young people, where the third sector is a delivery partner. Bill Kidd. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Uh, during the pandemic, Yoker, uh, within my constituency in Glasgow Annie's Land, was surveyed for community resilience as part of Sam H Inspire Mind and the Co-op's efforts to understand what makes communities resilient and how this strengthens an individual's mental health. The COVID recovery strategy also highlights how important communities are to tackling poor mental health and delivering support to those most marginalised in society who were often the worst affected by the pandemic. Will the Scottish Government give consideration to funding aimed at charities working in children and young people's mental health and crisis prevention in marginalised communities through the introduction of the Whole Family Wellbeing Fund? 
Deputy First Minister. I, I would certainly be very keen that the type of projects that Mr Kidd has raised would be reflected in the uh, Whole Family Wellbeing Fund. Uh, I think it is an opportunity for us to recognise that some of the mental health challenges individuals face um, are a consequence of a, a, a multiplicity of different factors. And it is by taking a holistic, in some circumstances, whole family approach, we will address these issues. I had the pleasure during the pandemic of visiting an excellent project in Mr Kidd's constituency in the Dram Chapel area, which I, I remember, which was an art-based project and it was immensely successful in stimulating uh, community engagement and assisting in addressing the, the well-being of individuals. So some very good learning from Mr uh, Kidd's constituency that we can build upon. And supplementary, Sue Weber. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Time and time again at Health, Social Care and Sport Committee, we heard of the essential role third-party organisations played in supporting people, young and old, with mental health issues and those with mental illness when statutory services were letting them down. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a negative impact on the mental health of people across Scotland, and for that reason, funding for charities and community initiatives will be more important than ever before in the coming years. But access to services is critical in supporting mental health. So can the Deputy First Minister outline why over 10,000 of our children and young people were refused access to mental health treatment during the course of 2021? And what assurances can he give me that urgent work is being undertaken to make services much more accessible this year and beyond? Deputy First Minister. Obviously, the, the issue that uh, Sue Weber raises with it is a very important issue. Uh, but the, the judgments that will have been arrived at will have been clinical judgments that will have been made by uh, the services involved. I, I would consider some of the issues that Sue Weber has uh, fairly raised with me within the context of some of the whole family wellbeing analysis that we are undertaking, where if we provide more effective support to individuals, in some circumstances through community organisations, we can avoid the crystallisation of mental health and wellbeing challenges because people are better supported, more included and more assisted in their endeavour. So that thinking has been brought to bear. I'm delighted that our local authority partners are working closely with us on the COVID recovery strategy in trying to make that a practical reality. But we need the engagement of the third sector, which I warmly welcome because uh, the third sector has a track record of being able to reach individuals who it may be more challenging for the statutory services to reach. Question number six, Natalie Don, who is joining us remotely. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the possible impact on its legislative programme of the UK Government's proposed Brexit Freedoms Bill. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Natalie Don brings up a important point. It is simply impossible at this stage to assess the full impact of Brexit Freedoms Bill on the legislative programme, given how little information has been shared with us by the UK Government. We only saw the full list of laws uh, uh, that the UK Government plans to change when it was published last week. Mr Rees-Mogg has asked the public to identify which retained EU laws it wants to do away with, but he has not asked anyone, including the Scottish Government, which laws should be kept. Natalie Don. Thank the Minister for that answer. Yet the lack of respect shown towards the devolved nations by this bill is staggering, and the uncertainty it causes for the work of this Parliament is deeply concerning. Can the Scottish Government offer assurance that it will provide what certainty it can by staying committed to the plans laid out in the programme for government and the principles of the EU Con Continuity Act? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. As Ms Dawn says, you know, the Scottish people did not vote for Brexit. We have been clear that this government believes that a future independent Scotland should seek to rejoin the EU as soon as possible, and that maintaining alignment with current EU laws will help us achieve that aim. It is impossible to know what full consequences of the Brexit Freedom Bill will be, given how little information. But one final point, President Officer. The main purpose of the bill appears to give the UK government the freedom to abandon legislation that has protected Scottish interests for almost 50 years. Supplementary, Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Farmers and fishers in the North East already know that they were sold a bad deal by the Tories with Brexit. They know that this Brexit Freedoms Bill will not provide what they need in order to continue in their chosen profession. 
Can the Minister indicate what plans and mitigations he thinks the Scottish Parliament should be considering to ensure the proposed bill does not unduly affect people, particularly those in more marginal communities? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. As I said previously, for 50 years, EU law has helped set and maintain high standards, created clarity for Scottish business and provided confidence for consumers. The stark choice facing the Scottish Government is either we do away with these things, which would be complete and utter folly, or do we spend parliamentary and government time, which could be otherwise spent on cost of living crisis, to keep them. To support economically marginalised communities, the Scottish Government is tackling child poverty, reducing inequalities and supporting financial wellbeing alongside social security payments that are not available anywhere else in the United Kingdom. Question number seven, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent cross-government discussions regarding NHS recovery from the pandemic have taken place as part of its COVID recovery strategy. Deputy First Minister. In 2021, we published the NHS recovery plan that set out commitments that will support recovery over the five years to 2026, supported by the implementation of improvements in new models of care. We have ongoing discussions with key stakeholders, including the National Health Service, across government and other UK governments around the NHS recovery. A full update on progress in the first year since publication will be published in September after the parliamentary recess. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The recent statistics highlight the huge backloads which have built up in our NHS. This year, the Scottish Government have been provided with the largest ever core block grant, which should be used to its fullest to ensure the NHS and public services are provided. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary to indicate what lessons have been learned from discussions with other governments across the United Kingdom to ensure that resources are targeted yep. to recover our public services? Deputy First Minister. Uh, well, that, that uh, type of activity is right at the heart of the decisions that the government takes on our priorities, whether in particular in relation to the NHS, which is the subject of uh, Mr Stewart's question around in increasing NHS capacity to meet ongoing health care needs uh, around the enhancing of primary care services, uh, the enhancing of cancer services or in the transformation of mental health services. So all of these um, points are right at the heart of the agenda the government has taken forward to improve public services, to tackle the, uh, the, 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 the very clear impact that the pandemic has had on the uh, the waiting times of individuals uh, for services, and as a consequence, um, we will endeavour to, uh, to, to make as much progress as swiftly as we possibly can do in improving public services. Question number eight, Liz Smith. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the role that the COVID-19 booster vaccination programme will play in its COVID recovery strategy. Deputy First Minister. Officer, since its inception, the Scottish Government's COVID-19 vaccination programme has been guided by expert advice provided by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. The JCVI is reviewing the emerging clinical evidence, including about vaccine waning, infection rates and hospitalisation. The JCVI's interim advice in May recommends an autumn-winter 22 booster programme for those at higher risk of severe COVID-19. Once the JCVI has reached a final position, we will confirm booster arrangements as quickly as possible to make sure those who are most vulnerable have the protection they need by this winter. We will continue to be guided by their advice and by that evidence as we have done throughout this pandemic. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy First Minister. Given the recent increase in cases, I will not be the only MSP, I'm sure, receiving inquiries from constituents asking for information about when the fourth COVID vaccine booster will be available to those not in the three categories currently. Uh, who are able to get it. And I raise this matter following information provided to me that it's in John's facility in Perth, which the uh, Deputy First Minister will be very familiar. Staff uh, were um, very free to offer vaccinations uh, because of the few number of patients who were attending. So could I ask the Cabinet Secretary to tell me when the information about further groups will be available? Deputy First Minister. We are, we are in the hands of the JCVI on this question. Uh, Liz Smith will understand that we, um, are, uh, we, we rely on the JCVI for their advice. Um, all governments have followed their advice, and uh, I think that has served us well. Um, we expect the advice to be with us uh, to be, so that we are in a position to roll out the programme um, probably around the end of September, early October. 
Um, but that is, I, I stress, that is conditional on us receiving the advice from the Joint Committee, um, which we do not yet have. But uh, we have strong facilities uh, in place around the country to enable us to deliver the vaccination programme. It has been an extraordinary success, and obviously we are keen to make sure that the population protection is boosted as a consequence of the decisions that we take in consequence of GCVI advice. Thank you, Deputy First Minister. That concludes portfolio questions on COVID-19 recovery and parliamentary business. There will be a very short pause before we move on to the next portfolio questions on net zero energy and transport. Thank you. Okay, the next portfolio is Net Zero Energy and Transport. Again, if a member wishes to ask a supplementary question, could I request that they um, press the request to speak buttons uh, during the relevant question? I place an R in the chat function. And I call question number one, Pauline McNeill. To ask the Scottish Government what range of heating systems it anticipates will replace gas boilers in the near future. Minister Patrick Harvey. The heat in building strategy identifies priority technologies available for deployment in the near term. Those relevant to homes currently using gas boilers are, first of all, of course, energy efficiency improvements uh, and also individual heat pumps in certain buildings currently using mains gas, uh, where assessment indicates short term cost effectiveness and also areas least likely to convert to hydrogen in the future. And finally, heat networks in areas deemed suitable. These are regarded as no and low regrets uh, options as across all plausible pathways to net zero. They are the, the ones that are likely to be the most cost effective zero emissions options in the buildings identified. Polly McNeill. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. Some already available low carbon cost systems, including electric boilers and heat pumps, have limitations. Heat pumps are disruptive to install, simply not practical or even possible for many households. Where they are viable, they are often prohibitively expensive, and electric boilers are very costly to run. Lord Wally Hockey, who is the biggest provider of heat pumps in the country, does not believe they are a suitable replacement for domestic boilers. Can the Minister tell me which low-carbon heat source the Government currently recommends for houses and flats that can't afford heat pumps, or, or where it's, they are unable to install those pumps that would be compatible to the cost of a gas boiler. Minister. Uh, I thank the, the member for that uh, supplementary. I have uh, had the opportunity to meet with and discuss these issues with uh, Lord Hockey, uh, who I know has uh, very strong views on it. However, the experience that we have and the comparable data that we have from other countries that have already had a long history of using uh, both heat pumps and heat networks uh, is that they will be effective uh, in Scotland. There are, as Polly McNeill points out, additional challenges in relation to flats and tenements, uh, which make up for around 40 per cent of uh, Scotland's homes. So it is clearly important that we uh, make progress in this uh, part of the, the domestic uh, sector to meet our statutory climate change targets. This is a complex area, and that is why we have established a tenement short life working group to provide recommendations to the Scottish Government on regulating uh, those homes. That group will provide its recommendations by the end of the year uh, and will respond by setting out a proposed approach as part of the forthcoming consultations. And it may well be that heat networks play a very significant role uh, in these type of buildings uh, compared with heat pumps at an individual level. Two brief supplementaries. First, Paul McLean. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer. As set out in the heat and building strategy, when a heat pump replaces a modern efficient gas boiler, the greater efficiency of the heat pump may be insufficient to offset the higher price for electricity, and this could increase the cost on the household. Will the Scottish Government therefore uh, urge the UK Government to rebalance energy prices to reduce the difference in unit cost between gas and electricity? Briefly, Minister. Yes, indeed. I mean, there are, of course, many areas where heat pumps are already being deployed, and where, combined with good levels of energy efficiency, 
the overall uh, cost uh, is coming down and can continue to come down. However, we have consistently called on the UK Government to take urgent action using its reserved powers to rebalance energy prices so that the running costs of zero emission heating systems are comparable to or more favourable compared with fossil fuel incumbents. Uh, so we are again calling on the UK Government to take full account of the needs of Scottish consumers, in particular those suffering the most from the impact of soaring energy bills uh, it, when they proceed with rebalancing costs on energy bills. And briefly, Brian Whittle who joins us online. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the number of boilers which need to be replaced in the coming years to achieve the Scottish Government's target is uh, significant, to say the least. What measures are the Scottish Government taking to ensure there are a sufficient number of professionals qualified to install and maintain heat pumps and other renewable heat technologies, both to deliver this transition and schedule and to prevent a lack of available contractors pushing up installation and servicing costs? Minister. Uh, yes, yeah, Mr Whittle is quite right to point out that the not only the scale of uh, installations that we need to see in the coming years, but the acceleration toward that much uh, more rapid installation uh, is going to be a significant challenge. And the work that we're doing on supply chains uh, is critical, both in terms of the supply uh, of the, the, the kit to install, but also the skills uh, uh, that are required to do that. But we see this very much also as an opportunity, not just a challenge. We estimate there's an additional 16,400 jobs that can be supported across the economy by the end of this decade as a result of the investment in the deployment of zero emissions heat. And it's by giving that strong signal of an intention to regulate uh, that we will give confidence to those who are inve investing both in the uh, manufacture and in the skills and capacity to do the installation work. Thank you. I'm conscious there is a lot of interest in this portfolio, so I'm going to need to have briefer questions and briefer uh, answers from the ministerial team as well. Question number two, Gillian Mackay. To ask the Scottish Government what actions it is taking to support, support the establishment of more publicly owned bus services. Minister Jenny Gilruth. Section 34 of bus, uh, provision of bus services etc by local transport authorities of the Transport Scotland Act 2019 came into force on the 24th of June, which was last Friday. It provides local transport authorities with the power to run their own services in any way they see fit within the wider context of their obligations. We have allocated a million pounds in the Scottish budget for the development of the Community Bus Fund in 2022-23 that will support local transport authorities to improve local bus services and to explore the full range of options set out in the 2019 Act, including local authority-run bus services. The fund complements our broader package of long-term investment in bus, including through support for our bus services, concessionary schemes for bus users, and over £500 million through the Bus Partnership Fund. We have seen a raft of service cuts across central Scotland, with driver shortages or efficiency cuts being blamed. When we should be increasing service provision, services are being cut. Stagecoach reported a profit of over £32 million for the first half of last financial year, and yet the X28 service, which serves Cumbernauld in my region, is up for cancellation. Does the Minister agree that more needs to be done to hold the private sector to account and that more support for publicly owned bus services could ensure the transport needs of our communities are truly supported? Jenny um, I absolutely agree with the sentiment of the, the member's question. It is worth pointing out that a considerable amount of public subsidy flowed to operators throughout the pandemic. I think it was over £210 million in total from June of 2020. And Ms Mackay will also be aware of the additional funding that I announced to the sector only last week. That supports the sector with the continued recovery from the pandemic, and it also allows them to respond to some of the changed travel patterns in relation to people working from home. However, I am clear that any subsidy from government to private operators is not sustainable, nor is it desirable in terms of the, the longer term ambitions here. And Ms Mackay makes an important point too in relation to the profit margins of some of these operators, which is particularly pertinent given that bus is one of the most affordable uh, forms of public transport there is. I will be writing to Stagecoach in relation to their proposed cancellations. I know she has uh, highlighted one with me today. I have had a number of members, as you might know, write to me about their own constituencies and cancellations in other parts of the country. As I did outline, I announced additional funding of last week, and bus operators who are in receipt of the NSG Plus grant are required to accept the conditions that set controls on fare rises and profits. And those requirements have to have regard, for example, to fair work. So I will expect operators who benefit from this public funding not to reduce services and instead to look after the communities that they serve. OK, we've got a number of supplementaries. Those will have to be brief and so will the responses. First, Graeme Simpson. 
Thank you very much. Uh, there are too many uh, bus deserts uh, in this country, so these new powers are an opportunity to do things better. Um, I like to be positive and help the Minister. So here's an idea. Will she convene a summit of councils and operators to examine the way forward? Minister. I know Mr Simpson likes to be helpful to me in this role. Um, however, I have to tell him I'm already ahead of him. I've already convened uh, working groups with operators on the back of a call I had with first and with loathing buses last week. There are a number of different challenges in this space at the moment. The first is in relation to, I think, service provision uh, and long-term funding. But the second is in relation to driver shortages. There's a real challenge here, and I want to work with operators to see what more we might be able to do to support as a government, recognising there is a split here in terms of devolved and reserved competencies. Neil Bibby. Uh, these are enabling powers for councils to establish publicly owned bus services. For clarity, does the Minister actually want councils to use these powers? Does the Minister agree that the bus market is broken beyond repair and that councils must take back control of these services? And if they do, does the Minister believe the Community Bus Fund is sufficient? Minister. Yes, I want local councils to run their own services. Why on earth would I be standing here and talking about the powers in an Act which give local authorities the power to do so otherwise? In terms of whether or not the Community Bus Fund is enough, we are working on the design and the scope of the fund, and that involves, of course, discussions with COSLA and also with ACTO. I recognise that a million pounds is not um, perhaps as much as other members might think it should be, but I think it gives us a good impetus to trial what an approach might look like in certain parts of the country. And that has to be done in partnership with local authorities. But I also reflect on the resource spending review, which allocated £46 million to the Community Bus Fund for the remainder of this Parliament. So whilst that initial £1 million might seem small to the member, that further funding which will flow will um, also contribute to that further £30 million which has been allocated in the capital spending review. But we've got to allow local authorities to get this funding right for their local area. That's what the powers in the Act allow them to do, and I'm keen to work with our local authority partners to deliver that. And briefly, Colette Stevenson who joins us online. <coughs> Thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government has already responded to requests by local authorities to be empowered to run their own bus services. The Government is committed to investing over half a billion pounds in long-term funding for bus priority infrastructure and has expanded free bus travel to under-22s. Does the Minister therefore look forward, as I do, to seeing how local authorities capitalise on these new powers and take advantage of the Scottish Government placing buses at the forefront of our just transition to net zero. As briefly as possible, Minister. Yes, I, I would agree with the sentiment of the member's question. As I've outlined to Mr Bibby, I'm really pleased the government is empowering our local uh, authorities with those flexible options to revitalise their local bus networks, including, of course, running their own bus services. And I look forward to working with them on the delivery of those models going forward. Thank you. Question number three, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether the £33 billion estimate in its heat and building strategy to decarbonise Scotland's buildings remains an accurate forecast amount. Uh, Minister Patrick Harvey. Thank you. As we did set out in the heat and buildings strategy, £33 billion is the estimated total gross capital cost of converting our building stock to zero emissions heat. This estimate is purely indicative and it is based on a single technology pathway with cost assumptions derived from the best available evidence, including research published by the Climate Change Committee. The Scottish Government continues to keep cost, uh, cost estimates under review, incorporating new evidence as it becomes available. Okay. Thank the Minister for the answer. In relation to decarbonising the 600,000 homes for social rent in Scotland, the Zest report says the fund will make £200 million available over the course of this Parliament. Now, that equates to £333 per property. So could the Minister tell me what percentage of these properties already have EPCC ratings or above, and whether his projections show £333 per property will be sufficient? Minister. Uh, I do not have the particular statistic uh, in front of me, but I would be happy to, to have colleagues uh, write to the member uh, to set that out. I am aware that social housing tends to have a higher energy efficiency performance uh, than the private rented sector, so we should congratulate them uh, for that. I also thank the, the social housing sector for the contribution that they have made to the Government's work on the Zest report, uh, the response to which was published recently, uh, and which seems to have been very warmly received by the sector. Um, supplementary Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I ask the Minister to outline how the actions set out in the heat and building strategy will help deliver the ambitious climate change goals? 
Who is possible, Minister? Uh, yes, the, the Heat and Building Strategy is a very broad, coordinated package of policies and support programmes. Uh, £1.8 billion in investment, widening the scope of our capital and advice programmes, uh, and collaborating with a wide range of partners through the Green Heat Finance Task Force. I am aware of the pressure of time. Uh, there is a great deal more detail in the strategy, uh, and I encourage Bill Kidd to work closely, as I do all members with us, in the implementation of that strategy. Thank you, Minister. And Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Sliding Officer. I was alarmed to hear that a new social housing development in the east end of Glasgow and Darmar is not being connected to the adjacent uh, Athletes Village District Heat Network. Do you not share my concern that there are huge opportunities for municipal development of these district heat networks that could refinance local government? And would you commit to developing a municipal strategy for ownership and development of district heat across Scotland? Minister. The, the member is quite right to, to point out the huge potential, not only for uh, connecting social housing developments to uh, existing heat networks, but investing further, including in publicly owned heat networks. When I launched the heat and building strategy, I visited uh, one, for example, in Western Bartonshire, uh, where the, the local authority is taking the lead uh, in developing that capacity. And the new National Energy Agency, uh, one of its roles will be to work with local government uh, to build that capacity. And I think there's huge potential for that in the years going uh, forward. Thank you. Question number four, Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I remind members of my register of interest to ask the Scottish Government what level of grant per property will be made available to assist homeowners to achieve the EPC rating uh, or better by 2025. Mr Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you. Just uh, first of all, to, to clarify, our heat and building strategy proposes that homes purchased from 2025 will need to reach uh, a minimum energy efficiency standard of equivalent to EPCC and all homes to achieve that standard by the backstop date of 2033. Uh, cashback grant uh, of up to £13,500 is available uh, to households for energy efficiency measures and zero emissions heating systems through our Home Energy Scotland loan and cashback scheme. And we have committed to replacing the cashback element with a, a standalone grant during 22-23, and we've doubled the budget to £42 million. Good uh, And I thank the Minister for that answer. Oh, sorry. In case of Oldstone properties, getting to EPC is not going to be easy. For example, it has been suggested that getting Butte House to EPC will cost in excess of half a million pounds. The level of grants that are being mentioned are not going to be sufficient for most houses to reach the required standard. What does the Minister consider to be a reasonable investment in a property to reach EPC uh, level C, and will you cap expenditure at that level? Minister. Uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to see that there is ambition for the, the level of support uh, that needs to be available. That, I, I'm sure, uh, is intended as an endorsement of the fact that the Scottish Government is providing more support uh, at this, uh, on, on this agenda than the UK Government is on its equivalents. But, yeah, we have a huge challenge, particularly uh, in remote and rural areas, in, as I mentioned, to Polly McNeill uh, tenement stock uh, and in older and historic buildings. Uh, all of this will be considered in detail as we uh, consult on the detail of the regulations, which will include uh, measures related to how we define the cost effectiveness uh, of, uh, of the measures that are going to be required. Thank you. Question number five, Ariane Burgess. To ask the Scottish Government how it will ensure that the future development of renewable energy involves community, communities meaningfully. Cabinet Secretary. Community and locally, locally owned energy has an important role to play in a just transition to net zero and will form a key part of the forthcoming energy strategy just transition plan. The Scottish Government is committed to supporting the growth of community and local energy in Scotland through mechanisms such as CARES, our flagship community and renewable energy scheme. We have long-standing good practice principles for community benefits from and shared ownership of onshore renewable energy developments. And these uh, set the national standards that we encourage renewable developers and communities to utilise. I am Burgess. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. Communities in Caithness and Sutherland live in an area rich in natural resources and renewable energy potential. However, many there feel that the communities they live in are being left behind with little to no consideration for their views or benefit. How will the Cabinet Secretary ensure that at least 20% of new onshore wind is community and publicly owned? Cabinet Secretary. Well, officer, we have a range of measures, as I mentioned, through the CARES scheme, which helps to support community and locally owned um, energy projects. We have 
to date almost 900 megawatts of capacity through community and locally owned renewable energy programs uh, projects, uh, which um, we want to get up to two gigawatts by uh, by 2030. Uh, and we encourage those developers to make sure that they are engaging in a meaningful way with the local community to also look at uh, community shared uh, ownership uh, models. What I should say to the member, though, is that we cannot compel developers to do this. The area of legislation in relation to this is a matter which is reserved to the UK Government. Um, I would like us to go uh, further in these matters, uh, but despite the fact that we have limited powers in these areas, we do certainly provide good practice guidance which we encourage developers to utilise when they are taking forward local projects. Thank you. Apologies. I am not going to be able to get any supplementaries on this question. Question number six, uh, Willie Wren. To ask the Scottish Government when it expects a decision to be reached on a railway station for Newburgh and Fife following the publication of the Newburgh and Area Scottish Transport Appraisal Guidance. Minister Jenny Gorris. The Scottish Government provided Sestrans with local rail development funding from, uh, for the Newburgh Transport Appraisal. Uh, Sestrans has advised that it intends to send Transport Scotland the detailed options appraisal report for the Newburgh Transport Appraisal in the next few weeks. This stage is the third and the final stage of a transport appraisal in line with the Scottish Transport Appraisal Guidance known as STAG. A completed, clear and robust strategic business case is required in line with uh, the STAG guidance before any further consideration can be made for any new proposals. Willie Rennie. Yeah, thanks, the Minister, for that answer. Um, the community are very hopeful that the railway option will be considered very highly by this appraisal because they feel cut off, even though the railway runs right through the middle of Newburgh. They are united, but they have been waiting for years for something to happen. So can I press the Minister again? I know the report will be handed over to Transport Scotland soon, but how long will it take for them to consider the report, and when does she expect a decision to be reached? Minister. So, in relation to Mr Rennie's supplementary, I very much recognise the feeling he described of hope in the local community. He will know of my own constituency and the long-running campaign in the Leavenworth area to re-establish the, the rail network there. And um, I understand, too, that the feeling that his community has in relation to their disconnect from the wider infrastructure on rail, recognising the geography of where Newburgh sits in the Kingdom of Fife. There is, of course, a, a process to be adhered to, as I have outlined in my initial answer to Mr Rennie. Um, that was, of course, the case with the reopening of the Leavenmouth Line, and it has been the case in the past with other rail lines. SCPR2, as he will know, does not make any distinct recommendations in that respect. However, he does ask a specific question in relation to the timescales. As at this moment, Transport Scotland have yet to receive the details options appraisal. I will ask my officials to provide my office with a timescale once that report has been received for review, and I'd be happy to share the details of that with the member once we have received that detail. We supplementary, Mark Ruskell. Thank you. The uh, Newborough uh, study was funded by the Local Rail Development Fund alongside uh, a range of other community projects uh, across Scotland. Can the Minister give an assurance that now those projects are coming to the end of their stag appraisal process, that they will all be considered? Uh, when it comes to allocating funds for rail infrastructure investment under control period seven. Very briefly, Minister. Um, well, I thank the, the member for his supplementary question. Um, I would join with him again in paying tribute to the hardworking community groups across the country, as we've heard from Mr Rennie. I was in uh, the North East on Friday of last week, um, hearing from their campaign group around about re-establishment of rail in that part of the country. And it is, of course, for that reason the government created the Local Rail Development Fund. And that fund, uh, the projects that Mr Ruskell has alluded to, are currently underway. They are being considered under the STAG guidelines. And where a strong business case is presented, these will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. But it has to involve local input in the process. And I think that is the strength, really, of the LRDF. Question 7, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve water quality in Scotland's rivers. Mr Mary McCallum. Officer, as I announced in my uh, ministerial statement to Parliament last December, the publication of Scotland's third river basin management plans set out our objectives to continue to improve water quality across Scotland from 87 per cent currently at good or better condition to 92 per cent by 2027. The plans are complemented by Scottish Water's Improving Urban Water's route map that sets out a programme of continued action to reduce wastewater pollution and sewage litter over the coming decade with investment of half a billion pounds. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Minister for that answer. Ecologists, conservationists and anglers have all expressed concern about the recent decline in wild salmon and sea trout stocks in Scotland's waterways, with stocks reaching record lows this year, declining fish populations 
um, are also being affected and damaging the wider ecosystem. This issue requires urgent action from the Scottish Government. So can I ask the Minister what immediate steps she is taking to deliver on the Scottish Government commitments to improve water quality? Minister. Thanks, President Officer. The Scottish Government um, takes very seriously the issue of our declining salmon stocks, and we're working with stakeholders to safeguard this iconic species. Um, the Scottish Wild Salmon Strategy, published in January this year, sets out the vision, objectives and priority themes which will drive our efforts to protect and recover this iconic uh, species. A priority theme of the strategy is improving the conditions of rivers and giving salmon uh, free access to cold, clean waters. And work is now underway with our stakeholders to prepare a detailed implementation plan to accompany the strategy. A very brief supplementary, Jenny Minto. Presiding officer. The campaign group River Action stated that the UK Government's draft targets for water quality to replace the EU's Water Framework Directive uh, had a general lack of ambition to improve the natural environment. We know the Tories' Brexit project No, this is, is not a brief supplementary, Ms Minto. Um, please, can the Minister give the Chamber reassurance that in Scotland we continue to value the natural environment and that this Government will continue to work to further protect ecological condition of Scotland's water Minister. environment? Yeah, happy to, Presiding Officer. Um, the big picture here is that after a decade of investment by Scotland's um, public water company, supported by independent regulation by SEPA, and all backed by nearly £700 million, we have 66% good water quality in Scotland. That is above the European average of 45% and far above our neighbours in England and Wales, who are at 16%. Thank you. Question 8, Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it plans to set a national generation target for solar energy, as it has for wind and hydrogen. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government recognises the importance of energy generated from solar PV in contributing to the decarbonisation of Scotland's energy supply and helping us meet our target for a net zero emissions society by 2045. In support of this, the Scottish Government will, in consultation with the solar sector, establish a vision for the future of solar energy in the forthcoming energy strategy and just transition plan, which will be published later this year. Annabel Ewing. I, uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer, and I'm very pleased indeed to hear that he is engaging with the solar industry and will be establishing a vision in the forthcoming revised energy strategy. But could I ask the Cabinet Secretary to consider very seriously the inclusion of specific targets uh, in that uh, vision that is to be established? Uh, and it has been suggested, for example, that the minimum target should be in the region of four gigawatts by 2030, and that a level of ambition be set and be set at the level of six gigawatts. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I am grateful for the Member's uh, question on this issue, and I am conscious that there are a number of Members in the Chamber who have an interest in this particular issue. Um, I can assure the Member that as part of the work we will take forward in developing our energy strategy, we will consider uh, the overall vision for uh, solar PV and solar energy in Scotland uh, going forward. The Member will recognise, though, that we also have to make sure that we take forward an approach which recognises the whole energy system and capacity within the network um, as well, which will be one of the factors which will be taken into account. But I have no doubt that those who are involved in the solar energy sector in Scotland will have an opportunity to feed into the energy strategy as we take forward our public engagement and sectoral engagement plan over the coming months. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions on net zero energy and transport. There will be a brief pause while the front benches changes and indeed the chair changes. Thank you. The final portfolio today is Rural Affairs and Islands. And if a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button or indicate so by entering the letter R uh, during the relevant question in the chat function. Again, succinct questions and answers would allow as uh, many members as possible to have their voice heard today. And I call question number one, Carol Mochan. 
Thank you, Deputy President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what preparations have been made to protect the economy of rural communities in areas like South Scotland from a repeat of the storms experienced last year. Cabinet Secretary Mary Goujon. The Scottish Government is working with resilience partnerships to ensure that the recommendations of the Storm Arwen report are, uh, review sorry, are implemented. We are also investing in a broad range of activities which will make the, uh, the south of Scotland economy more competitive and resilient to such threats in the future. £37 million was allocated to the South of Scotland enterprise in 2022-23 that will enable it to work with businesses and communities to create jobs and attract investment, and £3.6 million across 2021-22 and 2022-23 through our place-based investment programme will support town centre and community-led regeneration in the South of Scotland. And through the Borderlands Growth Deal, we are investing £85 million in strategic projects that are designed to boost innovation in key industry sectors, enhance regional connectivity and deliver critical business infrastructure to support economic growth. Karen Morgan. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? The response from local communities to storms last year and earlier this year was admirable and it is vital that they are included in the development of all future local resilience plans. Can the Minister confirm that the Scottish Government will work with local people but also with local businesses in the south of Scotland, many of which are very small, um, and work with councils to ensure that local small business economies, economies uh, do not face long-term adverse impacts of storms in the future, thus protecting local businesses and rural economy jobs. Cabinet Secretary. I think the member raises some really important points there because I think that engagement and that partnership working is absolutely critical if we're going to address challenges like this in the future. Now, I know uh, an update report on the back of the, the Storm Arwen review was published just last week, which set out some of the actions that we've already taken based on the recommendations. And there will be a, a further update to come in the coming months, because obviously within that time as well, we've had the, the report from Ofgem too. But I do, just to reiterate that I think that that partnership, working in collaboration with our communities, with local businesses, is crucial and, and will be part of that work going forward. And supplementary, Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the Scottish and UK Government's respective reports into the handling of Storm Arwen. Resilience planning is predicated on the good work and goodwill of voluntary community groups. Um, the, what I'd like the Cabinet Secretary to tell me is if she is actually confident that the succession planning for volunteer uh, response groups through the winter preparedness plans will be supported financially by the Scottish Government, particularly as we now see uh, a growing elderly population in rural areas. I know, again, uh, that this, uh, I know that, uh, again that this is a serious issue, an important issue that the member raises too, and I'm sure that that will be given due consideration. As I've set out in my previous response to, to Carol Mochan there about acting on the recommendations, we want to make sure that we learn as many lessons as possible from Storm Arwen and that we implement those changes ahead of the, the coming winter. So I'm sure that decisions such as that will be factoring into that consideration too. And supplementary, Paul McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. The storms of last year represented a pattern of adverse weather that is largely unprecedented. There can be little doubt that climate change has, played, has a role to play in new extremes, such as we, as we saw in 2021. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how initiatives like the Winter Preparedness Programme will help ensure that we can cope with new patterns of weather as they emerge? Cabinet Secretary. In Scotland, we do have uh, well-established and adaptable resilience arrangements which have been developed and have also been tested over a number of years too. But that continuous improvement is really at the heart of our approach to emergency planning. And the winter preparedness programme that the member and other members have mentioned, which is going to be led by the Scottish Resilience Partnership in the coming months, will seek to again ensure that we learn the key lessons from the Scottish Government's Storm Arwen Review uh, and to ensure that those lessons are, are learned and embedded ahead of the coming winter. And uh, I think it's important that, to note that, in particular, the programme will review the plans and arrangements for activation of our resilience structures across the country, mutual aid between areas and organisations, the public communications, how we support vulnerable people, and further of the voluntary and community sector into our emergency response processes. Question number two, Alex Go Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when the Rural Affairs Sec Secretary last met with Crown Estates Scotland. Minister Mary McAllen. The Rural Affairs Secretary met with Crown Estate Scotland on Monday, 27 June 2022, as part of a wider group at the Scottish Agriculture Council. I also attended that meeting, um, but as Minister with Portfolio Responsibility for Crown Estate Scotland, I formally meet with them three times a year 
and the most reading, re uh, recent meeting in that regard was the 20th of April. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful for that reply. In 2018, the Scottish Government established a due diligence test to establish the human rights and corruption records of the companies it does business with. That was after it dealt with Chinese companies connected to the abuse of human rights. Liberal Democrat research reported in The Scotsman today shows that Crown Estate Scotland didn't seem to know that diligence test existed when it was awarding uh, Scotland seabed leases. They invented their own test, which was effectively to ask the companies involved have you done anything wrong recently? It meant that Japanese company Murabeni, who paid corruption fines as recently as 2014, didn't need to declare these. This government promised to change its ways, but it seems that government bodies in this, the biggest sale for years, still aren't performing stringent checks on who they partner with. Given the Scottish Government insisted Scotland was sold on the basis of quality, Could we have not a question, price, please, Mr. should we take it from this that the evidence of corruption is not a bar? in the government's assessment of what quality looks like. Minister. Um, Presiding officer, Scotland is administered independently of ministers by Crown Estate Scotland. Um, as part of the Crown Estate's due diligence, they required a for, uh, all bidders to submit a formal, written, legal declaration that they'd not been convicted of unlawful activity across fraud, bribery, corruption. Uh, only companies who provided this legal declaration were able to proceed this was not invented, as has been characterised. This was consistent with Public Contracts Scotland Regulations 2015. Um, however, Scotland's terms and conditions make clear that the Crown Estate Scotland reserve the right to vo void any application uh, if false information is found to have been provided. Crown Estate Scotland will not hesitate to take action if need be, and the Scottish Government support them in that regard. Question number three, John Mason. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its latest assessment is of the impact of Brexit on the Scottish seed potato industry. Minister Mary McCallum. The loss of the EU seed potato expo export market as a result of Brexit and the UK Government's failure to secure an equivalence agreement for seed potatoes with the EU continues to have a very negative impact on Scottish exporters. Uh, we previously exported around 20,000 tonnes annually to the EU and 2,000 tonnes to Northern Ireland. And the removal of these markets overnight has cost an estimated £11 million. Now, that is a significant financial sum for a country, but it's also the livelihoods uh, of people and families across, this, uh, across Scotland. So it's vital that all options continue to be explored to find a resolution. And I can assure John Mason that the Scottish Government continues to press the UK Government at every opportunity. John Mason. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, or Minister, is she? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I understand the NFU Scotland President Martin Kennedy recently said that uh, you know, he is concerned that the UK and EU remain at loggerheads. He, he said, too, that the Scottish seed potato growers are the ones who are paying the price. And it seems clear that this is a failure of Brexit. C can the Minister say anything about what engagement she or the Government has had with the UK Government about this harm to our agricultural sector? Yeah. Minister. Um, presiding officer, I should say I welcome the efforts of NFUS and other seed potato representatives on this issue, and I share their concerns. Uh, we have continually raised the impact of the loss of the EU and NI markets and the, the, the impact that that's having on the sector. We do it through a, a multitude of platforms, most notably our uh, interministerial government meetings, but also uh, repeated letters. I should stress that this problem is a direct result of the UK government's refusal to commit to dynamic alignment. I'm very disappointed in the UK government's lack of progress and equally disappointed on their decision to allow where growers in England and Wales to purchase EU seed while Scottish growers are blocked from selling that same, uh, their seed into the EU. Uh, this is further in the undermining the industry and we'll continue to press them for, for progress. Question number four has been withdrawn. Question number five, Stephanie Callaghan. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports from Salmon Scotland that bureaucracy as a result of Brexit is costing the industry £3 million per year to export to the EU and is threatening Scotland's competitiveness. Cabinet Secretary. The figure quoted by one of Scotland's key industry bodies regarding increased costs faced by exporters as a result of EU exit comes as no surprise. The Scottish Government repeatedly warned the UK Government that our forced exit from the EU would be damaging to Scottish export businesses. And it's hugely disappointing that increased costs are threatening the competitiveness of Scotland's most valuable food exports. Stephanie Callaghan. 
I thank the Minister for that answer. Scottish salmon is highly prized globally, and the Minister will be aware that Salmon Scotland is calling for the full rollout of digital export health certificates by the UK Government to reduce Brexit red tape. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my view that the hard work of our salmon producers has currently been undermined, and that the best possible future for our salmon industry is an independent Scottish Government with the powers to make decisions that protect and support Scotland's exports and interests? Cabinet Secretary. And now we know that in 2021, 788 million pounds of the Scottish seafood was exported to the EU, but 372 million pounds worth of that was Scottish salmon. And the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation reported losses of at least 11 million pounds in January 2021 alone, as a direct result of the changes brought about by Brexit. But we have to remember that a lot of these costs are ongoing too, because uh, uh, in addition to that, the organisation also estimates that businesses are continuing to spend around £200,000 a month due to extra paperwork. And that cost continues to mount as inexcusable delays to the rollout of the digitalisation project uh, continue. And just last month, the Food and Drink Federation published a report which set out the, the strong growth in, amongst other food and drink export sectors, seafood products has driven Scotland's recent economic recovery. And we therefore can't allow the Tories to further impact upon the sector, which has been so resilient during these recent extraordinary times. Supplementary, Willie Rennie. I, I share the views about the, the damage of Brexit, particularly to the seafood sector, including salmon. I have Pitt and Weem Harbour in my own constituency, and they are suffering as a result of this. And a trade war would be damaging as well. That's why I just don't understand why the Scottish Government are pursuing the route of more borders, particularly to the border with England, uh, which would be equally damaging, if not more so. Has the Minister, in hindsight, not reflected on her position on independence and more borders? Cabinet Secretary. I can confirm that I have not reflected on my position in relation to independence, because I think, if anything, uh, being in this position, having the dealings with the UK government that I do, seeing the damage that is continually inflicted on businesses in Scotland, if anything, has strengthened my resolve to pursue independence. Uh, question number six, Mark Rusco. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission's call for the closure of unlicensed greyhound racing tracks in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government will carefully consider any recommendations from the Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment Committee and the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission for possible licensing or other regulation of greyhound racing in Scotland in due course. I corresponded with the committee on the 16th of May, informing them that greyhound racing is in the work plan of the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission as an issue to be considered in the medium term, and any recommendations that are made on the possible licensing or other regulation of greyhound racing will be carefully considered in due course. Mark Roscoe. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary's uh, response and also for her response to the RAIN Committee. It is clear, though, that sending dogs at 40 miles an hour around a track with a high risk of collision is unacceptably cruel, with injuries at the Shawfield track having almost doubled between 2018 and 2020. That's why the Welfare Commission is now backing an end to unregulated tracks, with the SSPCA one kind and others calling for an end to greyhound racing altogether. Can I ask, is the Cabinet Secretary prepared to consider a ban? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I think the member does raise some really important points there because I think it is... I just want to reassure both the member and other members across the chamber about just how seriously the Scottish Government uh, takes animal welfare and ensuring that we have the highest possible standards in Scotland. I think it is important to remember that those mistreating animals can now face up to five years imprisonment and unlimited fines under the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006 and the Animals and Wildlife Penalties, Protections and Powers Scotland Act 2020. So we do have those powers in place. But again, I would just come back to the point that we know that the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission will be considering this and I know that this is um, an issue that the RAIN Committee has been taking evidence on too through the consideration of the petition. So of course any recommendations that come out of this consideration we will consider seriously. A supplementary Colin Smith. 
Thank you, President Officer. It is not just on licence tracks like Thornton where injuries and deaths of greyhounds take place. Fifteen dogs were killed at the, the licence track of Shawfield over a three-year period. Nearly 200 were injured and numerous dogs were found with drugs in their system. Surely the evidence is already clear, Cabinet Secretary, that it is time for the Government to end this animal abuse once and for all and ban greyhound racing. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I agree with some of what the member has set out there in relation to, I think, some of the figures that we hear about, some of the instances that we hear about, which are truly horrendous. And again, we are committed to ensuring that we have the highest possible wealth, animal welfare standards in Scotland, which is why we introduced the increased penalties that we did through the Animals uh, and Wildlife Act. But again, that's where I look forward to these recommendations, because I think it's only right that I give these due consideration and the work of the Scottish Animal Welfare uh, Committee too. Question number seven, Rosa Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to safeguard food production. Cabinet Secretary. High quality, nutritious food locally and sustainably produced is key to our well-being in economic, environmental, social and health terms. Our vision for Scottish agriculture, which was published in March, outlines our aims to support and work with farmers and crofters to meet more of our food needs sustainably and to manage our land sustainably with nature. We are working with the Agriculture Reform Implementation Oversight Board to develop new uh, proposals for sustainable farming support and will be launching a consultation to inform a new Scottish Agriculture Bill later this year. Rosa Grant. The principles outlined in the Scottish Land Rights and Responsibility Statement are not enforceable. And because of that, we see farms being turned into forests to offset landowners' environmentally damaging activities elsewhere. And meanwhile, we face a global food shortage. When will the Scottish Government put in place enforceable responsibilities and principles to ensure that landowners manage their land in the public interest or forfeit that land? Cabinet Secretary. I know that this is a vitally important issue that the member raises, which is why the, the interim principles were established as well. I know that there will be a programme of engagement which will be undertaken by the Minister uh, for Environment too, to ensure that these principles are being in, uh, adhered to. And of course, there will be a land reform bill which will be coming forward in due course. But of course, I'd be happy to follow up with further information uh, and provide that to the member. A supplementary, Finlay Carson. Uh, yesterday, the Westminster Genetic Technology Bill Committee took evidence on gene editing, and there is widespread view in agriculture in Scotland that it is a good move and would improve crop yields and resilience, which are part of our food security. The committee also heard that the EU are definitely moving down the same route, so the issue is now not about divergence, but that will Scotland that will get left behind. It is only the dogma of the SNP government that prevents Scotland from joining the rest of the UK in adopting this important technology. So, President Officer, the door is open for the Minister to put aside blind adherence to EU laws and join the UK in developing this important technology. So I ask once again, when will the Scottish Government set out how it will address the GE question that everyone is waiting clarity for? Cabinet Secretary. We have said that we will continue to, to monitor the, the EU's position on this, uh, on this issue and the work that is happening there, and that is exactly what we will continue to do. And supplementary, Jim Fairley. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The report of the Short Life Food Security and Supply Task Force sets out a number of areas relating to food security which are reserved to the UK Government. And the Scottish Government's commitment to food production is clearly demonstrated through its commitment to active farming. And given that some of the levers regarding food security are reserved, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what response, if any, the Scottish Government has had from the UK Government regarding the report's findings? Cabinet Secretary. I established the Short Life Food Security and Supply Task Force together with industry in March this year to essentially monitor uh, the disruption to the food and drink supply chain resulting from the impact of the war in Ukraine. And the task force has just reported last Thursday, and I wrote to the UK government then uh, to highlight the findings that we had provided in that report. This is because the task force recognised that inevitably there are limits on what we can influence because of the global factors at play. And the reality is that the UK government also holds many of those levers to help address many of the issues that we need to tackle. Now, I haven't yet received a response to that, but of course we will continue to urge the UK government to take action. But the rapid response by Scottish government in establishing this task force has been really important, and I sincerely hope that we see that same focus emerge at a UK level. And question number eight, Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the proposed Islands Bond Scheme, including when it expects to publish the outcome of its consultation. Cabinet Secretary. 
The delivery of the island's bond is still being carefully considered in light of the strong feedback that we have received from island residents and within the context of the current energy crisis and rising living costs, which are being experienced by many islanders. Further details will be announced later this summer as part of the response to the 12-week consultation analysis report, and we expect to publish the analysis of that consultation in the coming weeks. Lee MacArthur. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? She will be aware of the concerns I have about the original concept behind the island's uh, bonds, but aware too that I believe this funding can help achieve its objective of attracting and retaining population by making our island communities more resilient. To that end, will she agree to look at the idea of using island bonds, perhaps in conjunction with investing in communities funding, to allow a third aircraft to operate across the North Isles in Orkney, providing improved transport links, connectivity and job opportunities for those who choose to live in these islands? Cabinet Secretary. I know that the member has uh, previously raised questions on this, this issue and concerns around that. We did undertake the, the online consultation, but as well as that, officials have undertaken a series of, of visits to our island as well. They've undertaken further engagement with our communities to really have those discussions, see what's important to, to communities, so that we can actually listen to the feedback that we have and act on it. And that's exactly what we intend to do. As I say, there has been an awful lot of work that's taken place since the consultation, so we're obviously analysing all the feedback to that at the moment and will be making announcements in due course. And supplementary, Alistair Allen. The Scottish Government has made clear its commitment both to retaining and to attracting people to live in our island communities. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that many young people face particular challenges in staying and that they need support for them to maintain their vital role in island communities? Cabinet Secretary. Oh, I, I absolutely do, because our young people have a vitally important role uh, in contributing, whether that's socially, culturally, economically, to our islands. But that's why, as part of the National Islands Plan, we created a Young Islanders Network, and that's made up of young people from all Scottish islands that will have a consultative role in the implementation of the National Islands Plan, essentially to ensure that the delivery of the plan does fully consider the interests and the priorities of our young people. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions on rural affairs and islands, and there will be a very short pause before we move on to the next item of business. Thank you.